Hello everyone, um, welcome to Nidan's event where we're focusing on election reporting amid multiple crises. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Shalini Joshi and I'm a program director with Nidan for the Asia Pacific region. Um, Nidan is a global nonprofit that works on improving the quality of online information. Uh, we work closely with partners across the globe, and we've supported many of our partners in monitoring elections in their countries. Um, in the last two years, we've had elections in uh, India, Philippines, Zimbabwe, Taiwan, and many other countries. Um, many of these elections have been quite historic for various reasons, and our panelists here will be talking about their experience of covering uh, these elections uh, amid many other events that were happening simultaneously. Um, I uh, would like to introduce the panelists and also uh, the event. Um, we are very happy to have here uh, Monica Bowling. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Officer at Mother Jones. Um, and under her tenure, Mother Jones has grown its audience 20-fold, uh, double the size of its staff, established bureaus in Washington and New York, and won multiple awards. Uh, we're very glad to have you here, Monica. Thank you for joining us. Um, we also have Ellen Tordesilas uh, from Verifiles. Verifiles is uh, an independent fact-checking group in the Philippines, and Ellen is a trustee and writer of Verifiles. Um, Verifiles is also a signatory of the International Fact Checking Network and a third party fact checker uh, of Facebook in the Philippines. Ellen has covered major beats, including um, uh, various elections in the Philippines, and she's been doing this since 1986. So we are very excited to hear from Ellen. Um, uh, the experience, uh, her experience, and that of Verifiles of covering the elections in the Philippines uh, in 2019. We also have here Jen C. Jacob, uh, who is the managing editor of Boom. Boom is India's premier fact checking digital initiative. Um, and Jen C. manages a newsroom of enterprising fact checkers. Uh, who are striving to keep our social media and public space clear of misinformation and also communally sensitive disinformation. Um, and a lot of this can have uh, uh, real life implications um, as we've seen with many misinformation um, events and, and campaigns uh, in India. Um, Gen C will be talking about the um, um, uh, Boom's experience and his own experience of covering the Indian elections uh, in 2019. Thank you for joining us, Jensi. And um, we also have Summer Chen, who's joined us from Taiwan, where it's very late in the evening. Thank you for joining us, Summer. Um, Summer is the chief editor of Taiwan Fact Check Center, and she leads the Taiwan Fact Check Center team to fight two battles against misinformation and disinformation in Taiwan. Um, and she'll be talking about uh, these battles. So one was the presidential election uh, that took place in January this year. Um, and the other, of course, is the COVID-19 um, pandemic uh, that also they've been um, uh, addressing. And, and there's been a lot of misinformation in Taiwan around the pandemic. Um, and the election and COVID happen around the same time. So Summer will be talking about that experience of putting out multiple fires um, at the same time. Um, finally, we have Sean, who's the co-founder um, of SITE, a Zimbabwean community space uh, for innovators, technologists, and journalists. Um, Zimbabwe had its election in 2018, which was a very historic election. 
um, and Sean had uh, has led um, a, a, a fact-checking initiative uh, around the elections to combat um, the information disorder uh, related to uh, politics and, and the elections at that time. Uh, thank you for joining us, Sean, and we are very uh, eager and keen to hear from you. Um, we had been thinking of this event as, um, you know, an event where we could look at uh, the experience of journalists and fact checkers of covering elections and also addressing misinformation and disinformation related to the elections. And we know from um, many uh, other experiences and our own experiences that covering elections can be very challenging when there are multiple things happening. Um, um, journalists are following the candidates on their campaign trail. They are monitoring uh, speeches and rallies, um, analyzing promises that have been made. Uh, and at the same time, there's a lot more going on. Um, we have the U.S. election coming up very soon, where there has been a lot of misinformation um, around um, uh, various issues. Of course, there's the pandemic and misinformation around that. Uh, there have also been wildfires um, in the U.S. There have been protests um, in the country. Uh, and amid that, what is the experience uh, of journalists here? And how can the experiences of journalists and fact checkers in other regions um, provide insights to journalists uh, and reporters in the US? That is one objective of this event. Uh, we also have elections coming up in various other countries. Myanmar has its election in November and um, Myanmar also has been uh, dealing with various issues, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, dealing with um, um, content on social media that is misleading, uh, that can at times be dangerous. Uh, and there are journalists and now also fact checkers who are looking at uh, covering all these issues. Um, so the idea of this event is really to um, learn from the insights and experiences of people who've covered elections over the last two years um, in 2018 and 2019 and Taiwan in 2020 uh, and see how that can contribute to the work of other journalists and fact checkers who are now covering elections in November and in the coming months. Um, so I'd like to hand over to the speakers, but before I do that, um, I, I just want to share the agenda. Uh, we'll have opening remarks from the speakers um, each speaker will speak for about two minutes uh, and share their experience of, of covering the elections and the highlights of that uh, election. Um, and then um, we will take questions from the audience. Uh, Monica will moderate the questions from the audience and also make her uh, remarks at that point. Um, and, um, and we look forward to a very exciting discussion. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sean uh, to talk about the election in Zimbabwe and your experience of covering that. Over to you, Sean. Thank you. So uh, let me start off with saying that in 2018, it was a hope of a new era. Uh, there was the previous months, the former President Robert Mugabe had gone out. So it was a very tense and hyped election. So there was a lot of misinformation and fake news moving around. So our experience that we saw during the election was prior to the elections, everything, the battle was fought online. And for the first time, we saw a lot of adverts being posted on Facebook and Twitter. You, you would not go anywhere. If you open any web page or open any um, website, you'll see like the presidential, the ruling parties adverts popping up on your screen. So it also led to the election being fought online. So in that instance, there ended up being two groups coming up. That was the opposition party and the ruling party. So there's a lot of misinformation held around all over the place. So that's way how we stepped in. So prior to the elections, we're trying to like debunk a lot of information. For example, you'd say political party A would say there were like X a number of people in a certain stadium. So we'd go there and try and verify to see using some tools from a fact checking toolkit to see if such people did attend such a rally. And yeah, a lot of things and also trying to 
debunk a few manifestos. We did, we had a limited time to do that. But the most outstanding and interesting thing was during elections, the election day, uh, we had set a target for ourselves that we would be happy if we were able to debunk close to 20 to 30 fact checks. And to our surprise, we managed to fact check close to 80 claims. And one third of them were labeled true. The other third were false, but the rest were either misleading or inconclusive. And the highlight was that uh, soon after the elections, there was a bit of violence whereby some short soldiers shot some protesters. And the image has been shown, for example, that there was a Kenyan soldier that was crying and people were saying that image was from Zimbabwe. So it stirred a lot of controversy around saying that the army was behind the people. But after verification uh, using check tools, uh, we noticed that the image was actually lifted from Kenya like prior to the elections like two years ago. So there were a lot of highlights that were happening, but those are the ones that stand out in my mind during the 2018 elections in Zimbabwe. Thank you, Sean. And uh, it's really amazing to see how many uh, pieces of information or misinformation you were able to debunk during such a busy time um, in Zimbabwe. Um, I, I'd like to ask uh, Ellen to come in now and talk about the elections in the Philippines in 2019. Uh, Ellen, what was that experience like? You also had a, a collaboration with other uh, newsrooms and fact-checking groups and you were collectively debunking misinformation around the Philippine election. So we'd like to hear from you uh, what that experience was like. Uh, I lost, I lost you. Uh, am I, can, can you see me? I lost you. Yes, we can see you, Ellen. Oh. Can, can you hear me? Oh. Um, oops, I think we lost Ellen. Um, hopefully she'll be back soon, some pr uh, problem with her internet connection. Um, uh, we, we can go to India until then, because India also had its uh, general election last year. Uh, and Gen Z, it um, was quite a busy election, and the period before the election was equally busy with the terror attack in Pulwama and then the election itself. Um, and post-elections, of course, has been quite crazy. Uh, but what was the Lok Sabha election experience like for you? Thank you, Shalini. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, with over 900 million people eligible for voting and uh, over half a billion people uh, having access to internet, uh, it's quite a crazy election uh, to cover in India and especially the misinformation space. Uh, we've been always uh, been preparing for the 2019 elections ever since we started uh, you know, covering fake news or, as we say, misinformation and disinformation since early 2017 onwards. So we were always working towards the 2019 elections uh, since we knew that there is going to be a, a flood of misinformation around that time. But none of us actually bargained for what was going to happen in the beginning months of 2019. Uh, as you uh, rightly pointed out, uh, that unfortunate and tragic incident of uh, over 40 paramilitary soldiers uh, dying in a uh, in a in a in a uh, terrorist attack in Kashmir, and post that, uh, both India and Pakistan nearly coming to war. Uh, that completely changed the tone of the election campaigning, and also uh, set a lot of the conversations on social media around uh, what probably the, the people were expecting of their elected government and how the elections are going to uh, pan out. And a lot of the best laid plans that political parties and the opposition party or the ruling party would have had till then, all of that took a toss. And as we know that in India, we have, a, uh, we have something called as the political IT cells, uh, which are quite active. Uh, so unlike probably the US where Donald Trump uh, is tweeting regularly on a daily basis and fact checkers are quite busy with, with his tweets, in India, we don't really have the political leaders going on Twitter and giving uh, those kind of tweets as uh, low hanging fruits for fact checkers to look at. We have to look at faceless uh, people who run uh, pages, uh, Facebook pages, Twitter handles, uh, and we have to actually look at them and try to keep uh, creating a database of accounts who we have to keep going back uh, to fact check them. So this was uh, broadly what we were doing during those times. Um, it was quite a tough time because uh, you never really knew uh, you know, uh, where are you going to get a new form of misinformation? So uh, we were completely on our toes. And uh, 
it's an election that we uh, uh, that you know that we learned a lot as a newsroom because a lot of the skills that probably we did not have even a few months before that we acquired uh, you know post that and after that as well after the elections as well we've been kept busy uh, you know uh, till this time so those are my brief observations thank you jency um and uh, now moving to summer um summer jency just talked about you know how challenging it can be for newsrooms and often newsrooms are small with limited resources few people who are constantly working during election and um, you've often talked about taiwan fact check center uh, being a small group so what happened during the elections and how was it possible for you to cover the taiwanese election this year uh yes uh this is a summer from taiwan fact check center uh during uh, the taiwanese uh, presidential election we only have four fact checkers and however it's it was the first time in taiwan we have fact check center uh, fact check uh, organization uh with um collaborate with facebook and the line uh to debug misinformation uh, during the election. So I, I think it's very important experience for Taiwan that we have an organization can stop, can um, stop the spray, the distribution of uh, disinformation. And uh, during this um, election campaign, I think the most um, in the most important uh, disinformation or malicious disinformation we saw is the disinformation about the election fraud. Uh, before one month, uh, the before uh, one month before the voting day, we uh, we can see uh, disinformation uh, talking about the poll about the polling fact. It has something. Uh, has some uh, something some some issue or some some suspicious uh, concern. For example, they will say, "Oh, uh, the dis the dif disinformation will say um, the the uh, the center commission they are going to che uh, cheat on the uh, voting uh, ballot, and they they will uh, when they." will print the voting uh, the ballot they will put some wax on the paper so when you want to vote on number two and you uh, it's pretty hard to vote on number two and the number two uh, or uh, or uh, just just like that is just like nonsense but uh, it's just spreading online and the Facebook, especially line uh, in Taiwan. I think Taiwanese are heavy line users. We will we will uh, receive information from line pretty often. So uh, uh, online, there are lots of uh, nonsense disinformation. And uh, after and the, on the uh, voting day and the after the voting day, we can see there is a big wave of those kind of disinformation and uh, uh, the malicious information will say uh, the why the DDP uh, will win uh, win the presidential election because they are cheating the uh, the election result actually uh, the election the election result has there is no candidate. Uh, adopt the the, uh, the election result, and uh, uh, each party think the polling work is fair. There is nothing wrong. However, the disinformation uh, just saying the polling work has lots of issue. And for example, there they they will say there on the CIA uh, put a very special ink. So when the when the people vote and vote to number two then the ink just disappeared uh after one one hour and the, so also the cia give ddp and other special ink so after one hour the the uh the the paper just have uh the stamp on number three just like this uh, there are a bunch of disinformation after the election. So I think uh, before, during the campaign, we can tell 
uh, who, maybe it's the um, the party just fight to each other. So maybe that's the information the disinformation is only from the parties. But um, for this kind of disinformation, uh, we we can sure it's not um, from the from any uh, parties. I think it's we can say it's mainly from China because there is no party has those kind of concerns. So we can say uh, it's from China. And those kind of uh, election fraud, uh, it even, uh, we, we can see even more since March, even the election end on January, but we can see more video or more, uh, more posts on Facebook generalized uh, after March, and they repeat the same thing. Uh, the DDP uh, was cheating on president election. Uh, I think it's really damaged our foundation of democracy because the polling work is fair. The, the fairness of the election is pretty important. It's the foundation of the, uh, our society, our, dem uh, our uh, democracy society. So I think those kind of um, disinformation is pretty malicious and it's tried to harm um, the foundation of our uh, society. We need to watch that. And uh, uh, we also can see it make more and uh, at the beginning, we, we, see, we see most of them are just nonsense. It attract only, maybe just only very few people to believe those kind of information. But the people still spreading them because another side, they just uh, feel upset so they will spreading those kind of disinformation um, and the people hurt each other um, uh, the other side just laughing why you are uh, spreading those nonsense uh, disinformation and uh, the other side uh, just uh, because they feel upset so they spread them i think it's hurt uh, it's um, make our society into two um, after the election. But we can see there is an other recording vote on uh, June. And uh, we can see those kind of uh, election fraud has an other wave. And it also make inference uh, on the next election or the next vote. So we, we, we are pretty worried about those kind of uh, disinformation in Taiwan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, thank you, Samo. I think some very important points have been raised by you. Uh, you know, like the misinformation and disinformation campaigns that we see around elections, they are actually an attack on the democracy uh, and many of uh, the countries that we are talking about are democratic nations um, and it's really tough to combat um, an attack on the democracy uh, for journalists and fact checkers it's really challenging uh, we're also looking at the US election and the Myanmar election coming up where again um, you know the, the democracy is being targeted um, we have some questions coming from um, uh, people who are attending the event. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to Monica um, to, to take uh, questions from the audience and also uh, to make some remarks. Over to you, Monica. Thank you, Shalomi, and thanks, everybody. Um, I think one of the... Um, compelling aspects of conversations like this is how much we find um, that we're all dealing with the same problems, no matter where we are. And, you know, Summer, I think what you just described, that um, this information has really come to target um, the infrastructure of democracy itself, um, that this information sources are not just attacking individual candidates or parties, but seeking to undermine the legitimacy of the process um, seems um, a really universal feature of elections in this moment, certainly happening um, in the United States, where the biggest source of um, disinformation seeking to undermine the legitimacy of the election is the president himself. 
Um, I wonder if um, Jensi and John, you could talk a little bit about how that played out um, in the elections that you covered. Uh, Monica, can you repeat that question? Um, there was an audio break for me in between. Um, did, to what extent did you see disinformation attacking um, the legitimacy of the election itself, election infrastructure? I remember seeing that you know there were, in fact, you know because of what was happening in India at the time, there were places where voting had to be shut down. So it's a rich environment for people trying to undermine the legitimacy of the process itself. And how, how did that play out and how did you counter that? Well, uh, as far as uh, you know, the legitimacy of the elections are concerned, uh, we, uh, we vote uh, through the EVMs uh, and uh, you know, we don't have the paper ballots in India anymore. And uh, you know, just before this election and some of the state elections that took place, uh, we saw a you know, lot of videos where uh, you know, in, in many of the, uh, some of the elections before that, uh, people had raised questions, especially the opposition parties had raised questions about uh, the, uh, whether the EVMs were safe or not. Uh, many of them actually put out videos where uh, if suppose, uh, you know, there are 10 uh, people trying to vote and every time they press the button of a, uh, of a, of a candidate of another party, they all would go to the ruling party itself. Uh, now, this was used as uh, one of the measures that people said uh, that, uh, you know, that the EVMs were hacked or they, are, they can be hacked. And hence, uh, in fact, there was a lot of noise around the fact that EVMs should not be used at all. Uh, the unfortunate part was that political parties uh, had also started raising this. So this was no longer in the realm of social media or the fact that people had doubts about the legitimacy of the process itself but even political parties uh, who had raised questions. In fact, this is the first election that EVMs, uh, you know, there were so many questions that were raised around EVMs. Otherwise, the, you know, the usage of EVMs were considered to be uh, one of the highlight uh, points as far as the elections in India are concerned. Uh, we received a lot of videos uh, where, uh, where many questions were raised. In fact, uh, we did fact, uh, fact check some of them. Uh, and the one common, uh, thread that we saw in many of these videos were uh, that there were no real credible, uh, uh, you know, uh, no, nothing which was, which you can say credible, which you can call credible where you're saying uh, that these were true. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the election commission also threw in a hackathon where they challenged uh, uh, anyone could come there and show them how it can be uh, hacked. And uh, there were various claims and counterclaims that were made, uh, but no one were really able to show credibly uh, that, you know, that EVMs can be hacked. So that was one of the uh, many uh, claims that we saw, uh, which were uh, made during the elections. But as I, but as I, uh, you know, as I can say that uh, none of these claims were credible in itself for us to believe that they were true. Uh, many of the videos that were floating around were, uh, were you know, uh, were, were quite misleading, uh, as we can say. Uh, some of them were raising questions about the fact that uh, that you know that uh, the hacked EVMs were being placed in the strong rooms, and some of the EVMs, uh, uh, you know, were being taken out. The fact that you know that enough security was not provided, uh, but beyond a point, none of these uh, these points could be proven, uh, and and that's why uh, after the elections, you know, a lot of them have lost steam. In fact, you know, some state elections have happened after that, and uh, we didn't really see the opposition parties raising those questions again. Oh, that's interesting. So it's um, that's that's an encouraging um, phenomenon that we um, don't often see that a disinformation trend loses um, traction. And I wonder, um, John, if you could. Um, I, I was I was really impressed to see the number of claims that um, you were able to fact check, um, and you said it you know split about a third, a third, a third between accurate, you know, maybe and definitely false. Um, did you, were you able to um, identify whether the debunking of the false claims um, had an effect on them? Did they, were they weakened as a result? Oh, so yes. So uh, what was prevalent during election day was 
uh, we were verifying claims on uh, voter turnout and intimidation in the sense that there were claims that were popping about, for example, that following the previous elections, people will say that an election, because people are voting in tents, so they'll say that uh, an election center had moved from point A to point B. So it was a way to try and frustrate the voter to not go to a certain point. So we'd quickly try our best to jump on a certain claim if, for example, they would say that uh, location A has been changed. And we were working with uh, election monitors on the ground. So we'd see a tweet on social media or even messages being circulated on WhatsApp. We'd probably, because we had a network of um, election monitors, we would send them a message and say, please, can you verify in such and such a place did, for example, uh, the tent move or, or not. And then we found that most of the time it was doctored or false news. So we would re reply and we fact check the information. Then we set it back down the channel, either through Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp. And in so doing so, we would get reports, oh, thank you, I was on my way there. And luckily I did not waste my time walking to that place. So it kind of like, you know, well, we couldn't measure it, but we felt that we were doing something there. And also prior to, um, voted day there were also circulation that for example it was targeted in the ladies that if you had uh, fake nails if you had nails you won't be allowed to vote because the special ink that they're supposed to put on your fingernails would not stay on the on these uh, add-on nails so they were discouraging women on uh, using those nails so women are saying okay but i just put in these nails so do i have to remove them for election so that was another way and luckily we did get uh, confirmation from the electoral commissioner board and even the commissioner did speak about and we used that video to share it down the channels again and so again you'd get a thumbs up saying oh thank you i didn't want to waste my makeup or my nails so in a certain way we did play a part when it came to also debunking this and also another popular thing was like you know those news headlines that you put on your newspapers people will take and photoshop them and change the headlines on uh, like a main daily newspaper and so we'd, we'd wake up quickly and then when you take a photo of the original uh, news headline and put it against the one that has been doctored and then we say no this is original this is fake because there's so many headlines being handled during the last week of the election trying to discourage the urban voter to go in out to vote on the day so yes, i think it did work that's wonderful um and you know, having having the direct contact with people who were replying that they saw it and were able to act on it um, is so um, validating. Um, I, there's a question in the chat um, that relates to what we were just talking about. And Ellen, I wondered if you could, um, if I could also get you to weigh in. Um, there's um, Madil from Philippines says, you know, we have 7,000 plus islands in the Philippines um, and there are about 7%, 70% commonly experiencing violation of election codes and human rights. So the question of fairness is challenging. Um, and I think yeah. that relates to the experience that a lot of, all of our countries have of people having real experiences of disenfranchisement of human rights violations. So it's not hard for disinformation sources to say, look, your vote has been stolen before, elections have been manipulated before, um, now we are telling you that it's happening again. Um, and, you know, Ellen, how do you, in an environment like that, um, how are you able to communicate that, yes, people are, um, Try, it, it has happened that people have tried to steal your vote, to suppress your civil rights, and yet some of this information that's coming at you is false. Oh, um, we, sorry, no, I, I was lost. I, mean, I got lost you know, a while ago. Anyway, um, um, we had our automated elections in, in 2007. So uh, because before that we had manual elections and we had uh, uh, incidents, rampant uh, incidents of cheating, ballot, um, I mean, uh, uh, cheating in not only during elections but also post elections. But anyway, uh, Filipinos love elections. That's why we have elections every every three years. We have the presidential elections and we have the the midterm elections where uh, senators are, uh, half of the members of the Senate are elected. So um, uh, to most Filipinos, um, especially those in the provinces, elections are more than just 
uh, voting for their candidates. It's actually a fiesta for many Filipinos. Elections are fiesta. Um, it's the only time when they feel important being wooed by um, national officials who forget and ignore them once they are elected. Although under the law, election campaign starts 90 days before election day, the campaign for the next election starts the moment officials are elected. Uh, social media's role in the election campaign became prominent in 2016 presidential elections, which was won by Rodrigo Duterte, the current president. Although all the candidates in the 2016 elections used social media for their campaign, it was the team of Duterte that effectively used it not only in building a network of campaigners, but also in creating a formidable network of disinformation as researchers Jonathan Ong and uh, Jason Cabanes detailed in their study, Architects of Network Disinformation Behind the Scenes of Troll Accounts and Fake News. Uh, the Duterte team discovered the potential of Filipino internet users as a, as a political force. 71% of the country's population, that's equivalent to 76 million Filipinos, are internet users and almost all are into social media. Filipino internet users are top in the amount of time spent online worldwide, which is an average of at least Filipino internet users spend at least 10 hours a day online, way above the world average of six hours a day. In the 2019 midterm election campaign, social media became an intense battleground of truth versus lies. Not wanting to see the repeat of unchecked misinformation and disinformation and the prominent role of, troll, of trolls in the 2016 elections, 11 media organizations and three universities worked together to verify and fact check claims in the run up to the 2019 elections. The project was called check.ph, T-S-E-K.ph and adhered to the code of principles of the International Fact-Checking Network. The University of the Philippines College of Mass Communication served as the secretariat. The pioneering fact-checking effort was supported by Nidan through its Czech platform and the Facebook journalism project. In the three months of operation, Czech.ph was able to flag 131 claims, which ranged from outright false to misleading like the claim of Amy Marcos, the daughter of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos, who was a senatorial candidate, and she won, of being a graduate of Princeton University. She was not. There were a number of false reports saying this and that candidate withdrew from the race. Vera Files on her own came up with fact sheets on some candidates. Aside from their profiles, we came up with their stand on uh, top issues which were um, mostly economic, uh, creating more jobs, fighting inflation, and fighting criminality. Whatever the venue of the election coverage, the basics are the same. Reporters should know the laws related to elections. So it's common sense. How would you know the, the candidates are violating something if you don't know the law? Um, re reporters should memorize election calendar, you know, and uh, like filing of candidacy, start of election period. And we should be wary of election surveys. Um, but we should, you know, to, 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 cover, to cover effectively campaigns, we should monitor, 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 cover campaign sorties, cover national debates, follow social media pages to keep track of the statements. The bottom line really is to keep the people informed, empower the voters with information that would guide them when they enter the polling booths and choose who to vote to lead the country. Because that's what we in media can do in the service of truth and democracy. So with that, yeah, that's- Thank you, Ellen. Mm -hmm. those, were, those were excellent recommendations and you know, distrusting surveys and polls um, feels highly apropos in many elections. Um, there are a few different questions um, from the audience that I think um, are, that relate to the overlapping multiple crises um, that we're all dealing with now. And some are um, 
you are really the, um, because the election in Taiwan happened in January, you're the only one who has really dealt with an, an election in an environment where the pandemic was already hovering in the background. Um, so can you help us understand how political disinformation um, and the pan and pandemic related disinformation overlap and what we need to look out for? Um, uh, for for Taiwan, we um we are very cautious on COVID nineteen. Um, I think since January first, because uh it was the time our uh, CDC um has a warning. They they just uh watch. There is a an unknown disease, and they think it's pretty just like SARS. So they want to get more information from WHO. So since January first, um, they have already announced a policy that when uh, they they uh, if the uh, fight directly from from Wuhan. Um, our CDC official, they will take uh, take on the plane and uh, go to check the temperature of uh, each uh, person. So since that time, we have already seen there are some um, malicious disinformation to indicate uh, there are lots of uh, person, lots of Taiwan businessmen. They will come back to Taiwan to vote especially they are from Wuhan. So um, it, it will be very dangerous if you go to vote at that day uh, because you, you will meet the people from Wuhan. Um, but at that time, Taiwan has no case, has zero case. So, so I think it's the disinformation won't uh, depress the voting rate. So it on uh, the, the the purpose they spreading those kind of disinformation is stop people go uh, voting. And uh, uh, I think it's pretty interesting. The election fraud video um, come in, uh, was coming. Um, they, they has a big wave uh, since March. It's not since uh, the end of election. Um, we don't know why, but uh, after the election, we are only busy one, we, we, we spent one week to debug a bunch of disinformation about the election fraud. However, when, the, when Taiwan has the first case and the, uh, during that time, the Wuhan has locked down and uh, the pandemic was just at the very beginning and everyone just watched on China at that time, the, those kind of disinformation disappeared for, for almost one month. And then it come back since March. And if we look at the China's status, um, China controlled everything since March, since the end of February, since March. They start to fight back about the international um, the stress from international society. Um, so, so in Taiwan, we also see the big wave of election fraud. Uh, those kind of disinformation come back since March. So, uh, so it's pretty. It's a pretty. I, I, I think it's a very. Um, it's a very interesting coincidence when China is was busy in handling the pandemic, the, those kind of disinformation just disappeared. And uh, when China controlled everything and the staff fight back the international society, um, then we see the, those kind of uh, election fraud video coming back and even we, we can see even more. So we, we don't, I think it's a very uh, interesting coincidence. And uh, um, um, so, so for us, we didn't handle those, uh, those two battles at the same time. I think it's, 
it's it's not at the same time. <laughs> it's one battle after another battle. And uh, when when COVID when we when we are uh, busy without the disinformation related about the COVID nineteen, um, we don't see any uh, election fraud. So so I, I think that's the most interesting part uh, in Taiwan. Summer, do you have advice for journalists? For instance, there's someone in Myanmar asking, and certainly this is acute in the United States too, mm -hmm. for debunking or fighting this information about COVID that is aimed at depressing turnout and election participation. Mm -hmm. um, when I when when I see the conspiracy about COVID-19 in United States, like the uh, it's China virus, uh, it's the virus is from Wuhan uh, lab. Uh, those kind of conspiracy uh, disinformation, I think it's pretty similar. Uh, uh, pretty similar uh, as the rumors spreading in Taiwan or in Chinese world since uh, February. So we can see there is a very interesting connection about the conspiracy disinformation in US and the, the conspiracy rumors in Asia, especially at the uh, early February. So we can see the same the same story or the, 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 the same um, formed uh, about those the, the same conspiracy disinformation so if um so if um american journalism journalists they they want to debug those kind of conspiracy uh disinformation maybe uh they can has another way they 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 can do the investigate about how the rumors uh has different version from Asia to United States. If we can write a story like that, then it will become a pretty clear uh, evidence to say how the this informer uh, make those kind of story. And also, I think um, when we see the US election, the um, the big the big wave or the big argument is the mailing um, the mailing voting um, the disinformation about the mailing voting I think it is pretty then it's a it make a very huge harm or a very huge influence um, on the uh, democracy uh, fundamental I think the journalists need to take more serious take those disinformation more seriously um, be, because um, those kind of disinformation is create a uh, atmosphere and uh, maybe the candidate has already know the results so they just create those kind of disinformation so when when the election results come out then they they, sh they should be some unrest about that because some support will feel very upset and they think it's unfair and there are something fish uh, during the voting process and they will take violence or they will um, they, 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 they will think the election result is uh, they, they can accept that and uh, I think those kind of disinformation is pretty um, Harmful and the pretty uh, and the, will make a very huge impact. So I think the journal, the um, United American journalists need to deal with those kind of disinformation more and take it more seriously. And uh, maybe um, it's not only publishing a uh, fact check about this, but also they need to uh, do more like a digital literacy or need to do more education about those kind of disinformation and how people uh, take it seriously. The politicians can 
can spread can cannot spread in those kind of disinformation because no matter the election result come out then they will they are always some vote some voter they will they they will they will they will never believe the those um voting system or the fundamental of the de democracy so i think those issues should be um should be focused on before the election and after the election thank you summer that's um, really excellent advice and i hope that um gargar in myanmar um that that's helpful to you as well uh, that the exposing where the information, where the misinformation is coming from and who is manufacturing it um, and being ready for um, politicians who try to foment distrust after the election um, is really critical. There's a question from um, Jingnan um, here at National Public Radio um, for all of you. Um, that I think is fascinating, which since disinformation travels so quickly on social media, uh, which social platform do you think is the biggest problem at the moment and what should they do? Well, in the Philippines, it's Facebook, which is the most popular platform. So it's uh, most of the disinformation is in um, Facebook. Although YouTube is uh, more, more, it's becoming more and more popular, and uh, but it's really Facebook that is, uh, it is the social media platform for in the Philippines. So th that is where also where we do a lot of uh, fact checking in Facebook. So, in India, uh, you know, I would like to answer this that question in two parts. Uh, you know, the 2019 elections in India, uh, according to one report on which we had actually filed a story, uh, it was the most expensive election anywhere in the world, uh, you know, to date in history. Uh, so 2016 US elections, uh, you know, the expenditure was ap apparently somewhere around $6 billion, uh, while in India in 2019, it was estimated. Now, these are unofficial estimates because uh, no one really always spends money uh, officially, and there are a lot of money which goes even under the table uh, in India. Uh, so the estimate was that it was somewhere around uh, seven to eight billion dollars, out of which the ruling party uh, itself spent about forty-five percent of that money. Uh, so you can understand the scale of money which is uh, being pushed into elections around the world, and especially in a country like India as well. That's one part of it. The second part of it is that. Out of this, uh, the official money that was spent on Facebook and Google, uh, you know, if you look at the scale, overall scale that I talked about earlier, it was somewhere in the range of 55 crore rupees. Uh, that's a few million dollars, uh, you know, if I, if I convert it into dollars. Uh, so that's, uh, but that is just the official part of it. But otherwise, you know, you can understand that uh, not everyone needs to spend money to spread misinformation on any platform. Uh, uh, you know, as far as platforms are concerned in India, the biggest uh, platforms where you will see a lot of misinformation is WhatsApp uh, because WhatsApp is encrypted. Uh, so there is no fear that anyone is going to either fact check you or call you out or publicly shame you or, or the fact that uh, you will receive a flag because of that. So WhatsApp is one of the biggest mediums with about 400 million people using uh, WhatsApp. That's one of the biggest mediums where we have a lot of misinformation. Apart from that, Facebook, which obviously is uh, quite an open medium, but Facebook also has, uh, I think in any country around the world, India has uh, somewhere around eight or nine fact checkers who are officially working with them on the program. So a lot of the uh, uh, fake news also gets uh, flagged as well. So there is some, uh, as some work that is going uh, into the process. Apart from that, Twitter is also a very big medium uh, where there's a lot of uh, you know, misinformation. But I think uh, uh, unlike the US, where a lot of people are on uh, digital platforms, in India, there is still a lot of uh, people or a lot of voters who are not really accessing digital medium. So uh, to say that probably only uh, misinformation on platforms will influence an entire election, I'm still not very uh, convinced about it. I know it's an unpopular opinion to, uh, to give, but I still don't think that India, we've reached that point where an entire election can be influenced uh, based on some misinformation that is going around on platforms. 
And I'd like to chime in that uh, in Zimbabwe, the, the one where we have most uh, fake news being peddled is, it's kind of like a bit of a class struggle. So WhatsApp, that's where everything goes crazy. People share stuff like no man's business from WhatsApp, but the conversation will normally start from Twitter and then it gets shared to Facebook and then it comes down to WhatsApp. So WhatsApp, because we are zero rated, meaning that everyone pays like an equivalent of one US dollar, then you get access to WhatsApp for a month. It's cheaper and it's easier to spread information. So someone's screen grabs a comment from maybe Twitter or Facebook, they discuss it, then they maybe uh, Photoshop it, bring it down to Facebook, and then from Facebook, it just goes crazy on WhatsApp. So our biggest main worry would be you try and nip it in the bud from Twitter, and then you try and also put it on many WhatsApp groups as possible to try and simmer down the fake news that is always peddled on WhatsApp. That's really smart to be um, thinking of how the platforms interact. Um, and Summer, you mentioned previously that Lime is a um, huge factor in Taiwan. I'm um, going to just toss in one more question for each of you. And since we're getting really close um, to the top of the hour, um, just want to ask all of you to, um, you know, take um, 30 seconds, 45 seconds um, to tell us if there's any one thing that you found can help you and your team um, stay sane and grounded as you do this work and as you interact with these huge questions and all this harmful content um, that you come across. Anything that keeps us grounded? Is that the question? That keeps us going? That keeps us it keeps going? You, keeps you going and keeps you sane and that keeps your team sane. I think it's the, it's the challenge of the I mean, I think the, the fact that there's so much to do, that there's a, there's a big challenge for us to really counter uh, this information, that that's what keeps us going, because we feel that we cannot just, you know, we cannot just stay idle. And that is, uh, and one way to do that is to really um, help the people, and help in, in empowering the people with information, with the skills also to fact check. And we, we believe that everybody, can be a fact checker that, and that the, the only way to counter this information is for the people themselves to be the one to, to, um, to be fact checkers. So that, that's, uh, I think that's, that keeps us going, you know. And well, I would like to say uh, that it's, it's an unequal battle to begin with. Uh, to say that a few fact checkers can resolve mm -hmm. all the problems in your country uh, is, uh, you know, is punching far above your weight, which we are already doing. Uh, don't allow anyone to discourage you by saying that fact checking doesn't work. I disagree with that completely because I often point it out uh, to people that before 2017, when uh, no fact checkers existed in this country, uh, you know, if you Googled anything which was uh, dodgy, you will not get credible information if the mainstream media has not covered it. Since then, in the last four years, uh, we have at least 15 fact checkers in the country, either IFCN certified or not IFCN certified, uh, and some of them being pro in the process of certifying themselves with IFCN. So it's an entire ecosystem of fact checking which has been created. And today, if you go on, if, if you are a discerning reader of anything which you get on WhatsApp or you're a discerning social media user, if you go and do that Google search, which many of us do and many people do despite having diverse political ideologies, you will at least sample a fact check. Now, whether you want to believe it or not is up to you. Now, that's not the fault of fact checkers. It's just the fault of our political ideology or the echo chamber that we live in. So don't allow anyone to tell you that you are the work that you do is not important. Keep doing it. And at some point, uh, there will be value to the work that we do. And apart from that, keep yourself sane by just switching off uh, You know, after a certain point in the day. And uh, don't look at violent videos or triggering videos, which actually trigger you. Not all videos trigger you, but some will. Uh, so keep away from them and always keep a stop point to when you will not do something uh, which you don't want to do. And I think you'll be fine. That, that, that's my advice. And my advice would be like uh, Jen says, say that we're punching above our the waist. 
is that you cannot exist in an island. So collaboration, collaboration, collaboration works when it comes to fact checking. So you try and work with other fact checkers and other try and bring journalists on board to try and help you because yes, we are swimming against the tide when it comes to this kind of like fact checking. So we learned during the elections, we did partner up with other, with other fact checking organizations during the elections and we did a lot, of, a lot of groundwork and some journalists came in and helped us. And also we used the crowd to try and help us uh, fact check some stuff where we had issues because there's some places that were inaccessible, but you'll find one or two or three different people comment. It says, no, I passed this place. This did not happen. This not did, did not happen. So after five or ten people send the same message that are credible, you use that. So collaboration is what I learned. So we need to work together and pull our resources. In that way, we are fighting against like you know big corporate you know newsrooms who are after the big buck. Unlike fake checkers, it's another thing. We try and be say you know verify some of the stuff that say. So again, collaboration for me is the most important thing, and work with others. Uh, for for me, uh, I I agree with uh Alan. Um, Alan um said uh, everyone can be fact checker. I think that I think the audience uh or um everyone in the society should be the first front of um uh, fighting dis fighting misinformation and uh, um disinformation. And actually, uh, although we encounter the challenge um, of disinformation, however, uh, we are pretty positive because we can see the audience uh, are following, our, uh, the audience is also noticed about this issue and they care and they read our fact check and they communicate. And I, I think fact check uh, creates a very, interesting space in the society. It make people think and make people, um, well, um, no matter what's the polit political position they have, but they, uh, but uh, before they, they spread, expressed their ideas, they need to have the accurate information. So our fact check um, created those space to, to, to provide people uh, accurate information and that helped us make good decision and a good uh, political choice uh, during the election. And also uh, we, we, we found in Taiwan since uh, 2019, since last year until now, uh, no, uh, whenever there, there is a workshop, or there is a conference, or there is a meeting related to, to uh, fake news, uh, disinformation, and the misinformation, and uh, about uh, how to do the fact checking. They are always full house in Taiwan. And uh, uh, when we released our uh, spot uh, online, and uh, within one day or three days, the spot are Full. So we can feel the so we can feel everyone is deserved to know what they should do and what they can do uh, to fight disinformation in Taiwan. I think that's a, that's those kind of energy uh, will be the very good will be very supportive uh, to build the fact checking or to build the digital literacy. Um, in Taiwan, I think that's a very good, um, good, good point. We need to uh, collaborate with uh, everyone and help them to be the fact checker and help them to do the to have the digi digital literacy idea in Taiwan. I think that will be the good. Um, uh, b besides publishing the fact check, I think the, the, uh, the education or the communication is also very good, important task for us to do. That, that's all. That's my advice. Thank you. These were all such powerful um, answers and we have lots and lots more questions that we could get to. I feel so inspired to be part of this group, um, but I fear um, that we've arrived at the end, Shalami, is that right? Yes, yes. 
Um, unfortunately, this uh, we have to end the event right now. But we've had excellent questions from uh, many of our guests here. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Monica, Summer, Sean, Ellen, and Jensi for coming to this event, for sharing your insights. Your work is extremely valuable and very inspiring. And we hope that um, our friends and journalists and fact checkers who've joined us from Myanmar and the United States um, and India and other places uh, have also found this uh, discussion equally uh, informative and relevant. We have elections coming up in uh, many countries, in many regions, um, in many African countries in 2020 and 2021. Uh, Brazil has local elections, India has state elections, and of course there's the US and Myanmar elections. So uh, very valuable insights. Thank you everyone and uh, stay safe everyone. Thanks. Thank you.